Okay, good afternoon everybody to the CLSA webinar series. My name is Ina Wolven, I'm the Managing Director of the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging and you're all welcome to today's uh, webinar. And with that, I'm going to start with an introduction of Gillian Mulvale. Um, Gillian is an Assistant Professor of Health Policy and Analysis in the DeGroote School of Business at McMaster University. Her research focuses on improving care coordination across health professions, sectors and stages of the lifespan through the development of health policy and management frameworks that promote interprofessional, person and family-centered care with applications in mental health and primary health care. So Gillian derives theoretical approaches from interdisciplinary training in health policy analysis, health economics and health research methods. So, and Gillian is the co-author of the recent report on the prevalence and cost of dementia in Canada, a review of the evidence commissioned by the Alzheimer's Society of Canada, and she is going to tell us all about that today. So, over to you, Gillian. Thanks so much, Ine. Hopefully everyone can hear me okay. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and I really welcome the opportunity to speak with everyone about the recent report, as Ine mentioned, um, looking at this important question of how do you go about estimating dementia prevalence, and are there opportunities from the CLSA? Um, and we were really tasked with the um, uh, challenge of how do we understand the various estimates that are out there. Not so much to come up with the one single estimate, but to really shed light on how those estimates are developed and how the various assumptions being made uh, influence those. Okay. So in terms of background, um, as I'm sure everyone on the line is aware, the prevalence of dementia increases sharply with age. Um, and some estimates suggest that 15% of the population 70 to 74 years of age uh, would have uh, dementia. And that when you get into the age category of 90 plus, some estimates suggest it could be as high as 40% of the population. And since we know we have an aging population and demographic projections suggest the population age 70 plus is going to double over the next 20 years. Obviously, from a policy and healthcare management perspective, this is a really important question. Um, and so there's important implications for the future need and cost for health and long-term care services. And so in light of this uh, situation, the Alzheimer's Society of Canada and the Public Health Agency of Canada commissioned a report uh, entitled On the Prevalence and Cost of Dementia in Canada, a, re a Review of the Evidence. And the lead authors were Michelle Grignon and Byron Spencer from McMaster University, um, and Susan Bronskill from Sunny Burke Research Center and the Institute for Clinical Evaluative Sciences, and myself were also co-authors on that report. And the goal here was really to provide a critical review of the evidence as it relates to current prevalence of dementia in Canada and costs associated with dementia. Uh, secondly, to assess the methods used to project these estimates of prevalence and cost. And this was really the, the critical piece to really try to understand these estimates. Um, the focus of the overall report was on Canada and selected comparative countries. Um, here we're going to focus on the estimates for Canada. I'll touch upon the comparative country estimates, but that won't be the focus of today's webinar. And also evidence based on survey and administrative records. Um, again, we're going to focus on the survey uh, as the source uh, of different estimates. Also note that there was a whole piece of the report around costs. We won't be touching that today, but it's something, if you're interested, that you can pursue in the report. So measuring dementia. Um, of course, it's important uh, that we get a definition that's clear. We drew upon Sheehan's definition that dementia is a clinical syndrome characterized by progressive acquired global impairments of cognitive skills and ability to function independently. And I think there's a key piece here, and that's the progressive uh, nature of the illness, uh, which is a real challenge when it comes to measurement, because it's important to decide at what point does cognitive impairment uh, meet the criteria for dementia, and then within that broad definition of dementia, there can be a, ver a variety of levels of severity. And that's important when you try to measure uh, estimates of prevalence. Are you comparing apples and oranges in terms of the severity of the illness when you're looking across jurisdictions, points of time, different estimates? And so Sheehan also did a review of the various methods we could use to assess and measure uh, tests for dementia. Uh, 
and identified 10 different methods that include a cognitive uh, test for cognitive impairment. Um, overall comments were that most of these don't take very long to do and yet perform well, both in terms of sensitivity and specificity to its own gold standard. Within each study, there would be a gold standard they compared against. However, overall, there is not one clear gold standard measurement for dementia. So measuring prevalence and incidence. Um, the other important thing to consider, and I'm sure many of you are aware of this, but just so that we're all on the same page, when we talk about prevalence and incidence, there's an important distinction. Prevalence is a stock measure. In other words, it estimates either the number of cases at a point in time or the rate in a given population group at a point in time. Instead, or in comparison, incidence is a flow measure. So it's the onset of cases in a given time period or the change in rate of prevalence in a time period. Um, so these measures, uh, are not always a one-to-one, -one. Uh, if we know prevalence, we know incidence, we, we can just automatically adjust prevalence because we need to understand the differences in uh, survival for different people uh, with various cases of dementia. It's not uniform. And so rates can be measured for the population as a whole with or without age standardization. Um, or they can be age standardized rates. And these are very helpful. What they do is they measure prevalence relative to a specific population age distribution. And so it makes it easier to compare uh, rates across time, changes in rates, or across jurisdictions. Um, also note that when you're being presented with a prevalence rate, it's really important to understand what the denominator is. What is the age group or sex group that it's referring to? So rates can be measured for the population as a whole, which will be much smaller than when they're uh, estimated for, say, the population 65 plus or the population 80 years or older. So there's other challenges in measurement that we also need to consider. First, how do we get reliable measures of new cases of incidence? Um, we know that diagnosis can occur at different stages of severity, so someone may uh, meet the criteria for dementia and have a mild case. Well, another person will have a severe case, and yet they would still both be counted as one, uh, an additional case of dementia. But we may be comparing very different disease states, which have important implications for policy and healthcare delivery. Second, severity itself is difficult to measure, so uh, it's easier to identify a case than to uh, identify the severity of that case. And registration of new cases is not something that's mandated. So it's not like we have um, a directory or a registration that we can just come up with the, the numbers of all cases that are out there. So in terms of how do we come up with estimates then, well, there's two main data sources that we look at, survey estimates and administrative records. And so the survey estimates can be either self-reported, so a survey comes to a person and that person indicates that yes, they or a family member has received a diagnosis of dementia from a healthcare professional, or the assessment can be done directly by a health professional. And we have examples of surveys that use each of these approaches, the Canadian Community Health Survey, or CCHS, and the National Population Health Survey, both use self-reported data in their basic form. And the Canadian Study on Health and Aging used health assessment by, uh, assessment by a health professional. Now I'll get into more details about each of those surveys a little bit further into the webinar. Administrative records is another approach. And in brief, what this approach does is it analyzes records um, in administrative databases. So that could be physician uh, billing data, for example. Uh, and it uses algorithms that examine those records to say, Given certain classes of medication that are largely prescribed or targeted to uh, dementia, how many individuals would meet those criteria? Also, other risk factors are taken into account in these algorithms, person's age, uh, sex, and so on. And so that's another approach to trying to come up with estimates. So if we think about surveys as data sources versus um, the administrative data, there's, there's advantages and disadvantages. So, of course, um, advantages of surveys is that they can really be targeted to understanding particular disease categories. Since the survey is being designed, you can ask the kinds of questions you want, 
You can focus particularly on different disease categories and go into a lot of depth there. However, uh, it's an expensive thing to do, to do a population uh, level survey. It requires a large sample size. Um, and also, it's difficult often to come up with a survey that will capture prevalence rates both in institutionalized and community populations. Um, often you need a different approach in either who's answering the questionnaire in an institutional setting, it may be a care provider or a staff person. Uh, in the community, it's likely to be the person themselves or a family member. And then there's issues around the accuracy of the survey, and that depends very much on uh, how the sample is structured, uh, response rates among participants, and then how accurately they're able to uh, respond to the survey questions. So there may be some uh, discomfort in um, acknowledging um, uh, a diagnosis by a physician of dementia for a person or family member um, or other biases that can result or perhaps misunderstanding uh, by participants in responding to a survey. And then issues around how large is the sample size, the higher the sample size, the higher, more precise the estimates are going to be. And finally, most surveys are cross-sectional. You can have longitudinal surveys, which are, you know, year after year uh, surveys of the same um, participants. Uh, of course, those would be more expensive. So most of them are cross-sectional. And when you have a cross-sectional survey, what that means is you get a snapshot of prevalence at a point in time, um, but you don't get information on when did that person uh, first experience the disease, so their in incident, I should say, or leave the disease in this case at death. Um, and also it can challenge our ability to do comparisons over time and across countries. If we think about administrative data sources, they too have their advantages and disadvantages. Um, some of the advantages of administrative data, typically uh, there's information on hospital stays, doctor's visits, and prescriptions that may be fairly accurate relative to self-reporting in a survey. Um, it can also be used to infer the presence of a particular disease. Um, it's a cheap data source because it's usually being already gathered for other purposes, so there's no incremental cost associated with using this administrative data, or I should say relatively low, there's always some cost. Um, they're usually representative because there's often very, very large samples. For example, most people go to see a family physician in, every year, or, and so you'll get a really good um, sample size in that sense. Uh, and there's also the opportunity to link to other data. So while there may not be an awful lot of other data, perhaps around lifestyle, um, sometimes we can link um, administrative data to other survey sources to gather information. However, there's disadvantages here too. Um, they're not really, these databases aren't designed for this purpose, and so how well they capture and estimate presence of dementia is a question. Um, how well do the algorithms perform? There can also be variation, just as there's issues with self-reports in a survey, there can be variation in how healthcare providers provide data to these administrative data, so, uh, uh, data sources or, or billing records, for example. Um, are they consistent in how they classify uh, information that they pass along? And in addition, there's limited additional information to determine the determinants and precursors of the disease, which you may be able to more fully explore in a survey. So, uh, as I say, this, this webinar is going to focus on our findings with regard to survey estimates. And in order to come up with that information, we conducted a targeted literature review, not a systematic review, uh, where we tried to identify the key surveys, published prevalence rates, and projections of dementia prevalence in Canada and a selected group of comparator jurisdictions. So we focused for comparators on the UK, uh, Europe as a whole, and the United States. Uh, we conducted a Medline electronic database search uh, over the period January 1990 to October 2014, and we used keywords related to dementia, prevalence, surveys, and methods, and variations on those. We also carried out Google Scholar and Google searches to capture gray literature. Um, we also explored government and survey websites to look for other reports that may be relevant. And we did reference checking of all of the various um, literature that we, websites that we uh, examined. And then it was an iterative search. We went back to the literature 
uh, for published academic pu uh, publications on the methods used in producing these various estimates and surveys. Altogether, we identified more than 40 publications. Um, of these, 26 contained prevalence estimates and or projections. We excluded any articles that at this round that were focused exclusively on methodological issues, so they came in in the second iteration of the search, um, or those that reported prevalence rates for countries that weren't on our list of comparatives. So clearly this is not a systematic review of every estimate out there, rather a targeted review that reports on what were felt to be the most relevant results for our purposes. So just to give you a bit of an overview of the various national surveys that we found that have a dementia focus. First, uh, the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging Neurological Conditions Initiative. Um, as many of you are aware, this is a developing research program, and so the results in terms of estimates are not yet available. Um, the Canadian Community Health Survey, uh, for the cycles in 2010-11, uh, there was a neurological conditions module that was added to the traditional uh, CCHS survey uh, with a follow-up survey if the respondent or household member showed or indicated a presence of Alzheimer's or other selective neurological disorders. Third survey uh, was done within institutions, institutional settings, so CCHS is a community setting. Here the survey of neurological conditions in Canada uh, for 2011 and 12. And this was a survey done by mail, uh, so mailed out to participants who were long-term care staff, and they were asked about the prevalence of 15 neurological conditions among their residents. There were also some other surveys that we identified, national surveys, uh, that were not targeted for producing uh, estimates of prevalence of dementia, but nonetheless have been used for that. And those were the Canadian study on health and aging, the CSHA. And this was a broader study that looked at the health and aging population in general. Um, within that, there, were, there was a significant piece around estimating dementia. And so 1991, 1996, and 2001 were the years of data collection. Also, the National Population Health Survey, which is an ongoing longitudinal survey, whose primary focus is not dementia, but a broad range of health conditions, and the Canadian Community Health Survey, uh, which is a cross-sectional survey uh, and longitudinal component has been added uh, every other year from 2001 to 2007 and annually since 2008. Again, looking at the broader health of the population and health services utilization, other measures not uniquely focused on dementia. The Canadian Study on Health and Aging um, this uh, study in particular has a multi-step neuropsychological and clinical assessment to really try to accurately capture dementia among participants. Um, the prevalence estimates based on this survey align with the DSM-3, um, and the core objectives of this survey were to measure incidence and progression of severity of the disease which requires a longitudinal approach to see how participants are moving over time. So we need these repeated observations on the same sample. And this provides data on the progress of dementia across various stages of severity, um, starting with those uh, with dementia at baseline. And for those who don't have dementia at baseline, how do we see over time then progress towards dementia? Comparing this study with the NPHS, so the National Population Health Survey and the Canadian Community Health Survey, um, they have collected dementia data by self-report. Um, so in this case, um, the, the person being surveyed or answering the questionnaire would be asked, has a physician ever diagnosed Alzheimer's disease or any other dementia for you or a household member? And they're responding um, on that, to that question. And the overarching objectives of these surveys are really not, as I mentioned earlier, to understand dementia in particular, but the broader health of the population and its determinants to come up with regional and national estimates. And so it can be useful, but it was not intended uh, for coming up with estimates of dementia problems. And finally, a little bit more detail on the survey of neurological conditions in Canada. As I mentioned, it was a one-time national level survey of long-term care facilities. Questionnaire was completed by the staff of those facilities, and they indicated the number of residents in total and by sex who have been diagnosed with either Alzheimer's disease 
any other dementia and 14 other neurological conditions. Again, by mail survey. And one of the limitations here is that it was very targeted um, and gave very little associated data to understand uh, covariates and other determinants and circumstances. So this slide uh, attempts to give you a bit of an overview of the various surveys in Canada. Um, so uh, the Canadian Study on Health and Aging, National Population Health Survey has three components, a household, that's the HH component, an institutional component, and one for the north. Um, the CCHF and the, uh, the uh, institutional survey we just discussed as well, the SNCIC. So you can see when you start to compare surveys, there's a lot of dimensions you need to think about. The year in which it was conducted, the design, was it a longitudinal, that's the L, or a cross-sectional, or both, um, CS. Uh, the setting in which it's carried out, was it carried out in the community setting or an institutional setting, or both? You can see here that only the CSHA was in both. The population that's being surveyed. So CSHA focused on the population 65 and older, whereas the community surveys are focusing on 12 years old and older. Sample size, and not surprisingly, the institutional component has a much smaller sample size. Um, as you can see, the CCHS, very large sample size, uh, very broad across the country. Uh, the method of interview. Uh, or method of data collection? Is it an interview with an examination by a physician? Is it by phone? Is it by in-person? Or is it by mail survey? And then considerable differences in response rates, although they're all fairly good, uh, but something to take in mind when you're considering um, the accuracy of the survey, as well as how are cases ascertained or determined, uh, cases of dementia. And so CCA, CSHA is both a self-assessment or self-screen and then an assessment by a physician. All of the others were self-reports based on an earlier physician diagnosis. So this slide is looking to provide you with an overview of what we came up with in terms of the prevalence estimates for Canada based on these various surveys. And again, um, you can see that it's difficult to compare, and there's lots of spotty places in terms of being able to compare all of these across the board. So depending on the author, uh, we can have different uh, estimates presented. So for the Canadian Study on Health and Aging, uh, 1991 data, if we look at the institutional setting, we have differences uh, from 56.9% uh, from the working group, that's the WG, the CSHA working group, compared with Graham. And it was very difficult. We were not able to really ascertain what the differences uh, that caused uh, those different estimates. But there's some general things we can see here also going on. We can see differences in the population over which these estimates are being generated, uh, differences in the year, uh, and then the setting. Is this estimate overall for the whole population within a particular age group at a point in time? Or is it just for community or just for institution? And we see that only the Canadian um, Study on Health and Aging gave us an overall for both uh, community and institutional. We also see, and that tends to be in the 7 to 8 percent range, um, we also see that in the community setting, much lower uh, estimates, so 4.2 percent from the Canadian Study on Health and Aging, 2 percent uh, CCHS 2003, uh, for the population 65 plus. We see that go down to 1% for the population 55 plus, um, and so on. So depending, uh, it's up to 4.3 when it's 80, 80, age 80 plus, and that makes sense. We expect a higher rate in a different population age group, an older population age group. We also see much higher rates in the institutional setting, which is not surprising when we think that about severity of illness. And so we see that, you know, any, any number that's out there that you look at, you're going to have to think carefully about uh, some of these various determinants of that estimate. So on this slide, we look at the data from the Canadian Study on Health and Aging in terms of prevalence by setting and severity of illness among those 65 and older. So within the community institutional setting and total estimates were provided, um, here we see that uh, in the community setting, the rates are higher for people with mild dementia and lower for severe. Not surprising. See the opposite, where uh, in the institutional setting, we see 31% uh, have severe dementia 
6.6% of those with mild dementia are in the institutional setting. And so overall, approximately half of those with dementia were living in an institutional setting, and this varies by level of severity. 85.4% uh, of those diagnosed with severe dementia were in the institutional setting, compared with 20% of those with mild dementia. So turning now to prevalence projections for Canada, what we found in our uh, review was that the projections uh, often can be based on the same survey estimates, uh, can really differ quite significantly. And this largely reflects approach and underlying assumptions. And so there were two main approaches that we identified. The first is where age-specific prevalence estimates are assumed to remain constant over time, over the projection period. And so we keep the prevalence rates the same in each age category and forecast out or project out what the population size is going to be in each of those groupings. And so when we do that, uh, we're either assuming that there's going to be no change in prevalence, uh, because the incidence rate and the mean length of survival are assumed to be unchanged, or any changes in those two variables are offsetting each other and balancing each other out. The second approach starts with base period prevalence rates, and each year adjusts that for uh, predicted changes in the number of new cases, so the incidence, and the number of deaths or mortality. So two very different approaches. And this graph shows us um, the prevalence of dementia projections for Canada based on three estimates that we were able to come up with in the literature review. Um, so when we look at these, the uh, blue line and the orange line are both uh, being driven by base prevalence rates uh, from, the, uh, from the Canadian study on health and aging. And so one set of estimates is from the CSHA working group. And the other was produced by Alzheimer's Society uh, in the Rising Tide report. And so they both begin with the CSHA data for 1991, but they take different approaches. Um, the working group assumes that constant age-specific prevalence rate, and so that's the blue line that's not rising as quickly. And then the Rising Tide uses this forward projection method where it, uh, it takes um, estimates of new cases and subtracts out mortality and uh, projects a much higher uh, uh, rate of increase in uh, the prevalence rate. Denton and Spencer, which is the gray line at the bottom, much lower, it has a different starting point because it's based on the CCHS, the Canadian Community Health Survey prevalence rates. So it's growing off that lower community-based uh, prevalence rate in the first place and then assumes those prevalence rates by age category stay the same and projects out the population growth for the community-based uh, population. And we see much slower increase here. So we aren't going to comment on which of these are right. It's something for you to think about. Um, but in terms of our key findings overall for Canada, the overall prevalence rate for the population age 65 and older in Canada appears to be in the 7 to 8% range uh, based on these findings. Um, the Canadian study on health and aging uh, remains the gold standard for survey-based estimates of prevalence and dementia in Canada, although we definitely recognize the information is now quite dated. We say this because of the quality of the algorithm, um, the large sample size, and the fact that it captures both the community and the institutional setting. And so what was also, I, I think, somewhat reassuring was that even though the approach seems less rigorous in terms of the case ascertainment, Similar prevalence estimates are found using data from the National Population Health Survey and the CCHS, which suggests that if you have a really good baseline prevalence estimate from a survey like the CSHA, these ongoing uh, community-based um, surveys can be helpful to see how does that uh, change over time, because there seems to be some overall consistency, even though it's a less expensive approach. In terms of what we found from the comparator jurisdictions with regard to prevalence rates, I, I mentioned I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here or we'd be on the webinar all day, but just to give you a bit of a flavor, um, the age standardized rates across Canada and Europe seem to be roughly similar in the range of 6 to 8 percent. Um, so in general, the European results and the UK results are quite similar to those in Canada. 
However, the U.S. estimates are, seem to be much higher than both of those, or all of those countries. Um, for example, for Alzheimer's disease, uh, the estimates are 11 to 13 percent uh, prevalence rate. And we were not able to come up with um, a good understanding of why those U.S. estimates are higher. However, we suspect that it's unlikely that it's strictly because of differences in risk factors. Uh, and more likely reflects differences in how dementia is defined and diagnosed. Or it could be that uh, uh, people are going to specialist care more quickly and being captured more quickly and diagnosed more quickly. I say that's not clear to us, but these are some possible explanations. So looking at the comparator jurisdictions in terms of methods, um, the Delphi consensus uh, process was another approach that we saw being used in the UK um, and in several European studies to estimate prevalence. So this was neither strictly a survey nor administrative data. And what this approach involved was uh, looking at published survey-based prevalence estimates, doing systematic reviews of those uh, published estimates, and then bringing together expert panels and pooled analysis to try to come up with an overall estimate particularly in Europe, across many countries. Um, the importance of definitions was a clear message that came out of reviewing these uh, studies. So comparative analysis, for example, of UK prevalence estimates over time was, there was a really interesting study by Matthews that suggests that, you know, we need to really keep a handle on these um, overall estimates coming out of the large surveys. So it's fine to do uh, these Delphi consensus approaches but every now and then we do need to gather new data periodically because this study suggested that um, over time we've seen uh, a significant difference in uh, prevalence estimates and a decline over time in the UK from, uh, let's get the numbers here, from 8.3% uh, in 1991 to 6.5% estimate in 2008. So this may be suggesting that there's a later onset, uh, people are healthier, unclear, but this study really said, you know, it's not enough to just take one estimate and keep it the same over time. We need to take a look at what's going on. It also suggests that in order to understand changes over time, we really need consistent definitions of dementia and the various diagnostic criteria being used. And finally, another message that came through was that we really need to make sure that the exclusiveness of the definition is matched to the purpose of the estimate being produced. So if we're developing programs where we need to really um, give people assistance with daily living, we aren't so much interested in milder cases of dementia. It's probably the more severe cases. And so we need to make sure that we're matching the estimates to the programming needs. So um, some of the overall findings that we came across with survey-based estimates. Longitudinal studies emerged as a very important data source in all of the jurisdictions we looked at. Uh, can either be nationally representative standalone projects like the Canadian Study on Health and Aging, or smaller scale studies were used both in Canada and the U.S., which draw upon infrastructure of larger nationally representative studies with broader objectives. Um, Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging uh, is, is looking beyond strictly dementia, but that's an example there, or the CCHS or National Population Health Survey. And comparing prevalence rates based on surveys is challenging due to methodological differences, particularly different age bands and subtypes of dementia. So what about the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging, uh, the, and the Neurological Conditions Initiative? Well, the primary objective is to support ongoing population-based research on dementia and selected neurological conditions. One of the challenges we have, though, when it comes to trying to develop prevalence estimate is that at the baseline, cognitive impairment is an exclusion criteria. So that means that if we're unable to come up with estimates of prevalence of Alzheimer's disease and dementia because at baseline, we're excluding people with cognitive impairment. However, participants can enter the study and become cognitively impaired during the course of the study, and they will remain in the study. This means it can be used for incidents and estimates of incidents. Um, the data, there's, there'll be baseline data from a tracking sample. The first 20,000 participants will be asked about Alzheimer's disease and other dementias as a self-report. So did a physician um, provide this, uh, a diagnosis for this for you or a family member? 
However, we know that's going to be an underestimate because of the exclusion criteria of cognitive impairment at baseline. The in-person survey uh, will uh, come from their more comprehensive sample of 30,000 respondents. And here we have a case ascertainment algorithm, which I'm just going to go into on the next slide. So this algorithm was uh, developed by the CLSA team, um, and it incorporates uh, a rigorous neuropsychological battery of tests that will develop composite scores in three domains, memory, executive function, and psychomotor speed. And that will enable the classification of participants into five different categories, normal, multiple domain cognitive impairment but not dementia, amnesic cognitive impairment, single domain non-memory, and dementia. And this becomes important because while um, the CLSA can't come up with an estimate of prevalence of dementia, it is nonetheless a longitudinal survey. And that means the baseline survey will give us some information around vulnerability to dementia and other risk factors. And then future ways of the survey will provide estimates of incidence, so new cases and increasing severity is something that it can capture as well. Um, using this categorized data from several ways may assist us down the road in understanding the progression of symptoms toward dementia over time um, and enable us to generate uh, transmission, transition probabilities across stages of the disorder, which will be very helpful for programming and policy um, uh, objectives. So I'm going to wrap it up there and um, you know, say thank you very much to the Alzheimer's Society of Canada and the Public Health Agency of Canada for providing the funding for this study and be happy to take questions and foster a discussion um, among all of you. Okay, so um, I'll start with the first question to Gillian. Um, um, and in the meantime, I was quite interested to uh, see why the estimates in the U.S. were so much higher. Um, and I know you were speaking about the, um, you know, you know, the possible explanations of why that is the case because people get diagnosed earlier, but you would think that uh, perhaps then the estimates in Canada would be similar uh, to the, the estimates in the U.S. Um, I know that, you know, was of, you know, you gave those explanations why you didn't really know, but um, might there also be an um, impact of lifestyle, for example, and do you know if anybody has ever looked at that in, uh, when you think about the U.S. Uh, numbers? Well, we spent some time as a group trying to digest why these would be different. Um, and uh, certainly lifestyle can be part of it. Um, when we look at the estimates from the various studies, though, it really wasn't clear. But I do wonder about specialists uh, in the U.S. being more direct and whether that's an influence in moving forward. And, uh, but honestly, it ended up being quite a, a, a challenging um, situation for us to try to understand that as a research team. And, uh, you know, we've recently presented this information to uh, a number of, of invested individuals and, and sort of nobody came up with a, a better explanation, but I'd be certainly interested to hear from other participants if they have other ideas as well. Okay, great, thank you. Um, there's another question for you, Gillian, from Christina. Um, she writes, do you have a concern about the use of self-report for estimating the prevalence um, well, of dementia? Well, in, in any situation, yes, there's um, going to be challenges with self-reported data. Um, we know that uh, from, uh, you know, survey uh, methodology in general, that there's always going to be some questions. Dementia is particularly challenging um, if we may have uh, difficulties with cognition in the first place. Uh, Self-report can be challenged, challenging. And there's also concerns around, you know, um, social, uh, you know, sensitivities with regard to reporting dementia on behalf of a family member and so on. And so, so there's a challenge there, and yet we were really struck by the fact that um, when we looked at uh, prevalence estimates uh, from the self-reported data from the surveys in the CCHS and the NPHS, that we still were seeing some, um, you know, at the aggregate level, uh, relatively uh, comparable estimates. And so, while there's a concern, um, we also have concerns, you know, with the administrative data. And so we have to work with what we've got. Um, it was somewhat reassuring that self-report from the survey data, uh, you know, seemed to, to perform well. Um, 
given its limitations when we compared that with the Canadian study on health and aging estimates. Okay, uh, great. Uh, another question uh, was answered um, by Andrew and he asked, what about differences in incidence and prevalence by ethnicity? Is that something that your report has looked at? No, it wasn't part of our mandate to look at that by ethnicity. It's certainly an interesting question and an important one that we need to look at, um, you know, down the road to really get a good picture at this. But we were really tasked with, you know, kind of more the overall estimates and comparing across countries, you know, I think part of the motivation here was the dramatic differences we see in the various forecasts of um, overall uh, prevalence rates. Uh, even within Canada, but when you start comparing to other countries. And when it comes to, you know, a health policy and management perspective, um, these are really, really significant for planning purposes. And so our goal was more to kind of understand the estimates, as I said, than to come up with one particular estimate or to break that down by um, ethnicity, but it's certainly something that uh, should be explored down the road. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, um, you also showed some of the uh, estimates for the European countries. Um, have you looked at any of the um, estimates for prevalence of dementia, say, in the Eastern countries like India or Japan, um, that is of interest also when it comes to ethnicity uh, in our own country? Is that uh, something that you looked at as well or are you aware of? Um, no, we didn't explore those. Um, you know, as I say, that was beyond the scope of this particular project, but mm -hmm. certainly in future research would be very much of interest, as you say, it could help to inform some of the questions around um, the ethnicity uh, for Canada, but also recognizing, you know, some of the differences in how these, you know, survey estimates are being captured across countries as well would also need to be taken into consideration. Okay, question by Christina, and it says, the CSHA found a high prevalence of cognitive impairment but not dementia, and can you, Gillian, comment on how this could be distinguished from dementia in a self-report? Yeah, sorry, I don't have an, an answer, but I think, you know, it could very much depend on the kinds of questions that are being asked to try to distinguish that uh, further mm -hmm. um, in, in terms of, you know, what is the root cause of the, of the uh, cognitive impairment. Um, I would think that the survey questions could be expanded to include that and to understand that a little bit better. Okay, great. Um, so I don't think I see any more questions and uh, we're getting close to our end time. So um, unless somebody has another question, you can type really fast and uh, we can answer Jill, uh, ask Jillian these questions. Um, in the meantime, Jillian, I really want to thank you for uh, this great overview of all the different uh, data that's available um, to determine uh, dementia prevalence in uh, in Canada and beyond, and uh, um, thank you very much for um, your insights. And I also want to thank our participants for um, logging on and participating in our uh, webinar. So thank you very much. Thank you.